There's a subreddit called Buy It For Life where people post pictures of products that actually last. The idea is to celebrate a seemingly bygone era of super durable goods which contrasts with the fleeting lifespan of the products we have today. There's something deeply satisfying about viewing these old products. They reach into your soul and tell you that everything is going to be okay. If you just use this ancient iron to iron your shirt, use this decades old machine to brew a cup of coffee, and wear these nine year old but newly repaired shoes, then your date tonight is going to go just fine, my son. You might dismiss this as simple nostalgia, but it's more complicated than that. Many of these products are older than I am, none of them are mine, and I've never seen most of the brands before. I can't be nostalgic for things I have no memory of. So why do I enjoy looking at this? I don't even know what it is. It's actually a flower sifter and it's about a hundred years old. I want to use it. Just keep it fucking new, normal sieve. Naturally, the forum positions itself against things which are not bought for life. There is an additional sub-forum about rubbish contemporary products falling apart long before they should. This features phone cases, smoke alarms that should last 10 years but last two, broken blenders, and a surprisingly large number of split shoes. It turns out boots used to last a really long time, like really long, but they're just one example of products that don't last anymore. Planned obsolescence has been around for almost a century and it refers to designing products so that they will reach the end of their lifespan quickly and have to be replaced by new ones. There are plenty of informational videos on YouTube which detail the history of planned obsolescence and teach you how it applies to things we see today. Some of the best are by Our Changing Climate, Veritasium and Marcus Brownlee and Marquez Brownlee. The podcast Stuff You Should Know also has an episode on it. I'm going to go over this history and these examples too, but I want to go beyond them. In my opinion, none of these videos truly attempt to explain planned obsolescence. That's not a criticism really, but it's curious that so many of them don't go much deeper than just demonstrating that it exists. For most people, that is enough, and the issues with it are deemed obvious. It does seem to offend people intuitively. As I've researched for this video, I've realized that it goes further than that. Planned obsolescence teaches us a surprising number of fundamental things about our relationship to consumption, to objects, to nature, and to capitalism. But let's recap the basics before we go any further. Have I ever told you the story of Yankee watches? In the 1880s, watch production was really taking off. For about a decade, the company Waterbury produced cheap but reliable pocket watches. When one Reginald Belfield took a Waterbury to work, his employer was so fascinated with it and how it could be easily taken apart and reassembled that he took it to pieces many times and put it together again. But the watch never suffered for the treatment. This satisfaction from disassembling things will come up later, so keep it in mind. But the type of watch that could be easily repaired would not be around for long. Another watch company, Ingersoll introduced a watch called the Yankee, which they sold for exactly $1. Other watches in the market typically cost about $10, so this was appealing, and the Yankee watch was extremely popular. Ingersoll offered free repairs. If you just posted your Yankee watch in, they'd have it back fully functioning in a few weeks. Yet people quickly realized that foregoing a few weeks without their watch was easily worth an extra dollar. They'd be better off buying a new one than waiting for the old one to be repaired. The result was that only 3% of Yankee watches were ever returned for repairs. This was arguably the start of planned obsolescence. While the Yankee watches were reliable, companies began to realize that cheap, disposable products might be the future. Mass producing at low cost without offering repair services proved to be the more profitable route. Customers would just keep coming back for more instead of repairing watches themselves, using third parties, or costing the company extra money by sending one in. Although before too long, pocket watches were replaced by watches with wrist straps and Waterbury went bust. In the 1890s, William Painter invented the crown cork, the familiar type of disposable bottle cap we still use today. Painter's own inventions, though, are less significant than the fact that he hired and befriended one King Camp Gillet. According to Giles Slade, Painter's advice to Gillet was explicit. Think of something like the crown cork, he told Gillette one evening in the extravagant parlor of his opulent Baltimore mansion. Once it is used and thrown away, the customer keeps coming back for more. 
Following Painter's advice and his own frustrations with razors that needed to be sharpened continuously, Gillet set about creating a disposable razor which actually worked. This took some time and it wasn't until 1905 that he'd perfected the type of flattened sheet metal which could be used to make these razors. Today we know them all too well under the name of Gillet razors, but you didn't see that one coming. The rise of disposable goods was not all bad. Before the 20th century it's worth remembering that we lacked the following. Tampons, plasters, tissues, disposable razors, and toothbrushes. Making many of these products disposable made them more hygienic. Their impact for the well-being and health of women in particular should not be understated. But these developments at the turn of the 19th century soon ballooned into something far more destructive and nefarious than throwing away a few used personal hygiene products. You may have heard of the Phoebus Cartel. This was an example of an actual, demonstrable, capitalist conspiracy to make everyone worse off in the pursuit of profit. The first assembly of the cartel was on the 23rd of December 1924 and included major corporations from across the world, with companies from the Netherlands, Hungary, France, Japan, the UK and USA. This was the first truly global cartel. During this time period, light bulb sales were exploding, but the industry was so competitive that it was hard to guarantee a foothold, even for the big companies. You're right. The computer business is too competitive. Sales fluctuated massively every year. The German company Osram saw its sales drop from 63 million to 28 million just before the cartel was created. Standard light bulbs at the time would burn for 2,500 hours, but light bulb manufacturers realized that this was far too long for them to make a reliable profit. People would buy their light bulbs and be set for years, thus leading to high initial demand, which declined over time. The cartel got their engineers to work on a solution that would cause the bulbs to fail reliably after 1,000 hours, which was a very specific and therefore difficult task. Despite the difficulty of the task, the engineers had some success and the life of a standard bulb dropped one third, from 1,800 hours in 1926 to 1,200 hours in 1933. No light bulbs produced by the cartel lasted any longer than 1500 hours and to ensure this, members regularly had to send samples to a factory in Switzerland for testing. Should the light bulbs last too long, the offending factory would be fined. This strategy was successful at increasing sales. Tokyo Electric saw their sales increase fivefold in 1927, while the cartel as a whole saw their sales increase from 336 million that year to 421 million four years later. The cartel defended their approach as creating brighter bulbs, but this was transparently self-serving. Brighter bulbs resulted naturally from a higher current flowing through the filament, and higher current was a relatively simple way to shorten the lifespan of the bulb. If you have too much current, then that current runs out much more quickly. Just leaving some time for the engineers to stew there. Brighter bulbs were an unintended consequence of the drive to shorten lifespan. They were not a deliberate goal to improve the customer's experience. The cartel's self-serving narrative also missed two crucial questions. Firstly, is it always better to have brighter bulbs? Arguably our modern lives are filled with too much exposure to bright artificial light, which can cause headaches, affect sleep, and generally mess with our perceptions. Secondly, the cartel could easily have devoted its efforts to making light bulbs both the optimal brightness and as long living as possible. They chose to pursue shorter lifespans regardless of the side effects because obviously they were only concerned with their profits. The cartel itself didn't last that long due to several factors. Foreign competition, largely from Japan, the inherent instability of an organization of selfish ghouls, and finally, World War II, all gradually broke the cartel. But its legacy of shorter-lived light bulbs continued for basically a century. It's only now that we're moving away from this kind of design to LED light bulbs, which last for longer and burn just as bright. The Phoebus cartel marked a new approach to obsolescence. While the Yankee watch was arguably an example of unplanned obsolescence, the shorter lifespan of the light bulb was the result of explicit planning by the cartel. This type of obsolescence is probably the most blatant and deliberate. It has therefore been the clearest target for litigation. The American light bulb companies were found to have violated antitrust laws in 1949, which included stipulations about them shortening the lifespans of the bulbs. Hey everyone, Editing UE here. Since I recorded this in June, I've been alerted to a new video by a channel called Technology Connections, which is quite a big channel. And this video disputes the idea that the Phoebus light bulb cartel 
well reduced the lifespan of bulbs in order to make a profit. It doesn't dispute that they reduced the lifespan of the bulbs, but it argues that essentially this was a way of making the bulbs brighter and actually less expensive for consumers. But the natural corollary of this is because brightness and length of life are inversely correlated. As they increased the brightness, the length of life was reduced. So it's a really good video, uh, disputes the standard narrative. I'd really, really recommend watching it. One thing I will say is that if you look at the antitrust ruling, United States versus General Electric uh, 1949, then you will find that there's a bit of back and forth about this. The court seems to accept that there is this inverse relationship, but still holds that the cartel and General Electric themselves had enough market power that they could determine what the industry standard for the length of the light bulb could be. So I think it's a little bit up in the air in terms of the economics that technology connections video is very focused on the engineering side of things and again it's really good go and watch it and you know make up your own mind i wish the light bulbs were an isolated example but they're actually far from the worst in 2006 epson was sued for making their printers stop printing lying and telling the customers the cartridge had run out of ink even though it hadn't. Epson paid a fine and reimbursed affected customers with coupons. In 2010, HP were found guilty of doing the same thing and in 2015 it was Canon. In 2017, several French printer companies were sued for similar reasons. Around the time the light bulb industry was pioneering planned obsolescence through sabotage, the car industry was discovering a different approach, perceived obsolescence. Henry Ford deliberately created the famous Tin Lizzie model of Ford cars to last, which it did, on average, eight years. As Ford put it, It is considered good manufacturing practice and not bad ethics occasionally to change designs so that old models will become obsolete and new ones will have the chance to be bought. We have been told that this is clever business, that the object of business ought to be to get people to buy frequently, and that it is bad business to try to make anything that will last forever because once a man is sold, he will not buy again. Our principle of business is precisely to the contrary. We cannot conceive how to serve the customer unless we make for him something that, so far as we can provide, will last forever. It does not please us to have a buyer's car wear out or become obsolete. We want the man who buys one of our cars never to have to buy another. We never make an improvement that renders any previous model obsolete. The brand loyalty resulting from this strategy was a powerful force. Ford's management methods meant that their costs were continually falling, and his monopoly meant that he could bring in new customers. But the simple fact was that they weren't coming back fast enough because the car was so reliable. An executive at General Motors, Alfred Sloan, did not share Ford's philosophy. He believed that continual improvements were the best way to engender progress while ensuring a healthy, sustained profit. As one of their first changes, GM introduced an electric starter instead of a hand-cranked one, which was, it has to be said, a useful invention that made starting cars easier. But Sloan's interventions became more and more cosmetic. He made the Chevrolet rounder, lower, and the hood longer to make the car seem more futuristic, even though the engine hadn't changed. Soon upholstery, interiors, windshields, and heating were on the agenda. Ford's Tin Lizzie became not only undesirable, it was the butt of jokes. Ford was forced by competition to cave in and introduce new colors, new comforts, and new cars. The original Tin Lizzie was a clunky and uncomfortable vehicle, which had to be updated at some point. But as with Yankee watches, this was when an industry realized the best way to make money, making older models appear obsolete, if only through their dated design. By 1955, one of Sloan's protégés, Harley Earl, was openly stating, Our big job is to hasten obsolescence. In 1934, the average car ownership span was five years. Now it is two years. When it is one year, we will have a perfect score. This was even better than planned obsolescence because it was low cost, sometimes requiring little more than a coat of paint, and could be controlled far more easily. Women became especially interested in these changes, which favoured comfort and aesthetics. Sloan realised he should appeal to women since they did most consumer spending in practice, controlling the family budget. This realisation about female spending would quickly blossom and make its way into the fashion industry. These days, fast fashion is one of the main culprits in planned obsolescence, and fashion brands literally burn tons of unused merchandise every single year. You know stockings? You know how they ladder? They don't need to. They could have been made more sturdy, but that was less profitable. 
So far, we've seen a few different dynamics driving planned obsolescence. Lower prices lead to replacement being more desirable than repair, as with Yankee watches. Companies deliberately make things malfunction, as with light bulbs and printers. Finally, marketing a series of minor or superficial changes can create perceived obsolescence, where old models seem out of date, even though they're perfectly functional, as with cars and fashion. And then there's Apple, who do all of these things at once. Apple's ripping off of customers is so brazen and well-known that The Simpsons had an extended bit on it. With an announcement that will completely change the way you look at everything. Ooh. And that announcement is... You're all losers! Oh. You think you're cool because you buy a $500 phone with a picture of a fruit on it? Well, guess what? They cost eight bucks to make and I pee on every one! <laughs> the bit was pretty heavy-handed and lacked any noticeable insight or wit. I think this was the moment I realized The Simpsons had really changed and... Oh wait, this video is about planned obsolescence. Apple are the masters of perceived obsolescence. They bring out a new model almost every year. These usually contain marginal improvements like the camera, but they also have a bunch of virtually useless changes. You know they're useless because they are changed back again next time. The corners of the iPhone go from round to square, back to round and back to square, so that new is always different. They've gradually got larger on average, but the size fluctuates too, and now there are multiple versions of the same model which are different sizes. Why can't we just buy an older, smaller version over the new small one? Do you remember these plugs? You might argue the new plugs are better, but they're not because they're notorious for being shit. Headphones originally had the classic jack cable, but then got changed to plug into the new smaller charger. So then you couldn't charge and listen to your headphones at the same time. That's not even a neutral change, it's just bad. Of course, this was all to promote wireless headphones, which run out of steam within a couple of years, and I'm sorry, still make you look like a prick. Hey, you know what isn't planned obsolescence? The news. You know how when something has happened and once you read about it, you know about it forever, and when the next bit of news comes along, it doesn't mean that the old news hasn't happened? That's great. I enjoy that aspect of reality. News is forever, as the old saying goes. Right now, France is investigating Apple for planned obsolescence. The story is being covered by 26 news outlets, and it's interesting that the coverage skews more to the centre and right. Perhaps because it's about business and economics, topics the right is more apt to cover than the left is. Which means you may have missed this if you predominantly read left-leaning news. I found this story on Ground News, a website and app that is designed to help you dive deeply into issues of the day. They gather thousands of sources from around the world in one place, so you can compare coverage. Besides every article, you'll see tags for who owns the publication, how reliable their reporting practices are, and whether they have a political bent. You can compare headlines or click through to read full articles. For example, one outlet highlighted the fact that Apple was recently fined by France, Italy, and Russia in an antitrust case. And you can see Russia Today, a government-affiliated news outlet, is reporting on the France investigation. If you want news, then you won't do much better than ground news, because they keep you updated with what's going on around the world. You can use my link ground.news forward slash unlearning economics to get 30% off their unlimited access plan. By signing up through my link, you directly support my channel. So thank you to Ground News for sponsoring this video. As I asked at the start, why is this history of planned obsolescence so galling? Why do I want a flower sifter so much? Why do we attach so much value to things which are built to last? Why do I want a flower sifter so much? Hey guys, subscribe to my Patreon and buy me a flower sifter, please. I recently attended the Globe Theatre and it was great that it was really old. I'm sorry, I found that in my script as the placeholder line. Uh, should we start again? I recently attended the Globe Theatre to see A Midsummer Night's Dream. I'd never been to the Globe before and actually I'm not sure I'd ever seen a Shakespeare play live before. I know, I know, I'm a charlatan. Sorry for not going to public school. The play itself was fantastic, but I was more enraptured by the general experience than the storyline. There was something in knowing that people hundreds of years ago had stood in the same spot and watched the same play I was watching now. And don't get all Theseus's ship on me, nerds. I know it's not technically the same building or place, but it actually is, so shut up. You may point out that not everything is the Globe Theatre, which is correct. Not everything is the Globe Theatre, because that would make life literally impossible. But our attachment to things that have existed for a long period of time goes beyond just historical landmarks. 
In California, they have the oldest light bulb in the world, the Centennial light bulb, which has been running non-stop since the late 19th century. Not only does this prove that light bulbs can run for really, really long periods of time if they're not sabotaged, it shows how much people value things that already exist. Even though it's ultimately just a light bulb, it's famous and people visit it frequently. As with the globe, there's something satisfying about knowing that it's been on for over 100 years. Some people say the light is too dull to be useful, but that's just Phoebus cartel propaganda. In one sense, the issue with planned obsolescence is obvious. We are being ripped off. We could feasibly have higher quality goods for longer periods of time than we do. This leads to us spending money unnecessarily for rubbish products. But there's more to planned obsolescence than it rips us off. G.A. Cohen once wrote an essay called Rescuing Conservatism, A Defense of Existing Value. You know how conservatives say they want to conserve traditions and things which make us great, and you're like, hey, yeah, I like some traditions. My whole family always has a cooked breakfast together on a Sunday. Not sure why, but it brings us together. And then the conservative is like, no, I don't think being gay is real. And you're like, cool. I don't think we're talking about the same thing. Cohen identified the reasonable version of conservatism as a preference for things that already exist, just by virtue of the fact that they exist at all. We may not want to replace one thing with another, even if the new thing is of greater value. Cohen uses the example of his old and battered eraser, which he owned for 46 years. He didn't want a new eraser, but he also didn't want an identical old and battered eraser, as he put it. There is no feature that stands apart from its history that makes me want to keep this eraser. I want my eraser, with its history. What could be more human than that? Cohen likens our preference for existing objects to love. When we love somebody, we may well love many of the qualities that make them attractive to us, but we also love them uniquely. We wouldn't love someone else even if they had the exact same interests, mannerisms, looks, and so on. Something similar can be said for objects, which we love in a way, though hopefully not the same way. Cohen makes clear this valuing of existing objects isn't absolute. We may value something which exists, yet still want to replace it because it's stopped working and the new one is such a massive improvement. We all know someone who won't replace their ancient, uncomfortable, gas-guzzling, dangerous car. Equally, we can value the new and the old side by side, as long as the new doesn't result in the destruction of the old. A city with both Shakespearean buildings and shiny skyscrapers is a valuable thing as it adds variety and gives us perspective on how unevenly history unfolds. Plus, the architecture of both fits nicely within the brutalist, modernist approach. Just leaving some time for the architects to stew there. Intrinsic value captures why we are so uncomfortable with throwing things away unnecessarily. Whether it's a light bulb that ran out too soon, a printer which lied to us, or stockings which ladder within a week. Planned obsolescence means losing the things that we have over and over. It starts to erode the value of existing things because they haven't been around as long, and we expect we'll replace them anyway. We lose what attaches us to objects in the first place. Cohen defends this type of conservatism on the following grounds. I endorse certain conservative factual assessments according to which a lot of valuable things have been disappearing lately. I join the ranks of complainers down the ages who say, things ain't what they used to be. Planned obsolescence is often expressed in almost these terms. They don't make them like they used to, or so the saying goes. In Prosperity Without Growth, Tim Jackson discusses the role that material goods play in our lives. We need the basics like food, water, shelter, and clothing for obvious physiological reasons. But beyond that, we consume things largely because of the meaning attached to them. This goes well beyond modern capitalism, since attachment to things has been observed across vastly different societies and throughout history. A wealth of evidence from anthropology supports this basic point. Stuff is not just stuff to us. Materials matter in non-material ways. Consumer goods provide a symbolic language in which we communicate continually with each other, not just about raw things, but about what really matters to us. Family, friendship, sense of belonging, community, identity, social status, meaning, and purpose in life. Some of our possessions can feel like a part of us. If you ever had something you treasure stolen, you'll know exactly what I mean. We can illustrate this all with a simple example, this book. This copy of Prosperity Without Growth is signed by the author, Tim Jackson. There's actually a story behind it too. My school friend's mum is a proofreader and she worked with Tim Jackson. She got talking to him about economics and mentioned that her son's friend was into it, so he sent me a signed copy. This book is unique and I wouldn't want to swap it for another one. Now, that's all very nice. Contrast how quaint that story was with my relationship to this phone. Um, the 
the script is actually playing on the phone while I'm talking, so this is getting a bit meta. It's a Google Pixel because I got fed up with Apple like so many people. I've not had it for a long time, I guess, but I don't think I've ever felt attached to a smartphone. The fact that it will be obsolete soon and probably already is contributes to that. I've already smashed the uh, bottom of it as well, which doesn't really help. Despite its flaws, this phone is objectively a technological marvel and it's also substantially more expensive than the book. I need it because of the functions it serves, but I don't care which phone I have. If I were asked to give up one of these, then it would be no contest. The phone isn't special, but the book is. You may say that few things have the kind of meaning a signed copy of a book does with a unique story to boot, but I could just have easily have told you any combination of events. It could have been the first economics book I ever read. I could have got the book at a special or even difficult time. I could have bought it in a special place. I could just have owned it for a really long time. The longer we have things, the longer they accrue these meanings, especially in relation to other people who gave them to us, shared them with us, or just admired them. Many ancient rituals by indigenous groups revolved around material objects for this exact reason. This may be why people are so angry when they are unable to repair their phones. In 2017, Redditors noticed that battery performance seemed to slow after the many software updates implemented by Apple. Apple admitted that they deliberately made the battery slow, although they defended this as necessary to maintain performance. Apple eventually settled a lawsuit for up to $500 million in total compensation to users. They were also fined 25 million euros in France because it would deem they'd been deceptive by not alerting consumers to the slowing battery. But this was just a small part of the general picture. iPhones and other smartphones were almost impossible to repair. It wouldn't be such a problem for users if they could easily take out and replace old batteries and other parts. But there are several reasons that they couldn't. Firstly, the way the battery was attached made it virtually impossible to take it out. Secondly, it wasn't possible to buy a replacement battery. Thirdly, the instructions for how to change parts were not publicly available. This all culminated in something called the right to repair movement, which demanded that Apple make it possible for consumers and third-party repair shops to have the ability to fix the phones. The name right to repair is quite an interesting choice in this context. Legal rights were not really in dispute, at least in this case, but the feeling was that if you cannot practically repair your own phone, then something fundamental has been taken away. It's more than just the money or the waste, it's a right, and not having it severs the relationship we have with our material possessions. It opens up the question of whether you truly own the thing at all. When we dispose of things, their value to us disappears, of course, but when we repair them, their value to us is enhanced. One study looked at repair workshops in four different places across the world and found that people seem to develop newfound love for their things once they've taken part in repairing them. As one repair cafe worker put it, people often have an epiphany when they watch their first repair. They often don't even expect that their repair will be possible. But something happens when you open a machine and see what's inside. You see that there is a way that things work. We've seen that many, many times. There is value to learning how the things you own work. This produces a level of engagement with the world around you and reduces the alienation you feel from knowing nothing about the possessions you rely on so much, such as your phone for one. Recall Reginald Belfield's story about his employer's fascination with his watch, who took it to pieces many times and put it together again. The watch never suffered for the treatment. Getting to know and repairing something is another process that can make the things we own unique with their own history and idiosyncrasies. You're likely to remember repairing it and the new parts you used, as well as, unironically, the friends you made along the way. It makes what was previously a normal, mass-produced good become something interesting. In terms of planned obsolescence, one interesting fact is that older products have higher repair success rates than newer ones, indicating that things are, in fact, no longer made to be repaired. Okay, so that was me trying to do an anthropology, so I'm sorry if I fucked it up, but you know, disciplinary boundaries aren't real, so that's my excuse for venturing into the field. Now let me venture into another one.
The seam was okay, but the charm just wasn't there. The modern animation style marked when The Simpsons lost its soul, but it also reinforced it, making the show look as well as feel sterile. I take the old jokes with the old jaggy style any day of the week. Oh wait, this video is about planned obsolescence. We have good reason to suspect that planned obsolescence will impact the environment. The logic is simple. Planned obsolescence shortens the lifespan of products. Consumption of goods increases, increasing energy and resource use. And more waste is produced, which ends up in landfills. We should retain some scepticism of this simple logic though, because complex systems like economies and the environment can throw weird results back at you, even when you think you have them figured out. Let's not be internet libertarians and think that we've logicked our way into eternal truths. If you're a man of culture, you may have noticed this section is really short. That's because we don't know the impact planned obsolescence has on the environment, despite it probably being the most important consequence of the practice. That's partly because it's so difficult to define and comes in so many different forms. It's also because research into the area has been wholly insufficient. One area we do have good information on is electronic waste, or e-waste which is a good stand-in for planned obsolescence. Between 2000 and 2010, product lifespans for consumer electronics fell on average by 10%. If lifespans decline by 10% every 10 years, then in 100 years, our products will last for zero seconds. Just leaving some time for the maths people to stew there. Laptops, smartphones, and tablets are one of the key culprits. The average smartphone is kept for only a couple of years, the average computer for only slightly longer than that, and the average printer prints for only about five hours over its whole lifetime. As we've seen, these things are difficult to repair, and so they often end up thrown away when they've got minor or even no problems, just because a new one has been bought. It's fair to assume that most e-waste is a result of some kind of planned obsolescence. We produce over 50 million tons of e-waste every year and the number is growing. Under 20% of this is properly collected and recycled, while the rest is either thrown into landfill or exported to poorer countries, even though that is technically illegal. And so, the consequences. E-waste generated 580 million metric tons of CO2 in 2020, which is projected to increase to 852 million by 2030. For context, digital technologies are roughly responsible for 1% of total greenhouse gas emissions. It has been estimated that doubling the lifespans of these devices could save 2 or even 3 billion tons of CO2 emissions over the next decade. It doesn't end with emissions. E-waste, you may have guessed, is not biodegradable and contains a lot of toxic materials such as mercury and lead. It makes up only a small percentage of total landfill, but the majority of the toxic metals within that landfill. This can find its way into water and soil, which can poison local wildlife as well as food supplies. Numerous toxins are at elevated levels in local soil, air, water, wildlife, and humans. You can recycle e-waste, but our chosen method for doing so leaves a lot to be desired. Scientists have said that mining e-waste for precious metals instead of ore could be a more efficient and sustainable way to get them done, if done safely. When e-waste is recycled in poorer countries, people, sometimes children, work with open flames and little to no safety gear to extract materials. The largest e-waste processing center in the world is the Chinese city of Guiyu. The area has concentrations of air toxins 300 times higher than nearby Hong Kong, and that's up to 50 times higher than WHO guidelines. Children have higher lead blood levels and lower cognitive abilities than similar towns. E-waste appears to induce genetic mutation among workers, with chromosomal aberrations around 20 times higher than among non-workers. It turns out you can just throw phones away and forget about them, but the environment, like an elephant in the famous saying, never forgets. Whether discarding them or shipping them off to poor countries to be dealt with, there is a massive impact on people and planet. You may have heard of the circular economy, which is the idea that all the waste from one part of the economy should be used somehow in another part of the economy, instead of being discarded. This creates a circle through which materials pass continually, but are rarely if ever thrown away. One of the key phrases of the circular economy is reuse, repair, and recycle. The rising interest in repair, which we discussed earlier, is another important aspect of the circular economy. It reduces the raw materials used because, at most, you'll need a new part instead of a whole new product. Sometimes the repair will be even easier than this and require no new raw materials. Either way, the impact on the environment is reduced. 
I've not done the circular economy justice with that short paragraph, but it seems like a compelling alternative to the current practice of either throwing away obsolete items or shipping them off to other countries to be recycled under questionable conditions. We would need massive interventions to make the circular economy more widespread. This all leads me to a broader point I want to make, and to understand this, we'll have to go back to the emergence of the term planned obsolescence. The origin of the term planned obsolescence is actually kind of odd. It was first written down, at least, in a self-published 1932 essay written by Bernard London called Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence. This was during the Great Depression in the USA, and London argued that the downturn could be solved by stimulating demand. But instead of just spending money on creating new things, London took an interesting argumentative turn. He asked a simple question, why don't we dispose of and destroy all of our things after a set period of time and then make new ones? I know, it's surprising nobody asked this sooner, it was just staring us in the face. I actually thought this essay was a parody when I first read it. I assumed London was poking fun at the incessant focus of capitalism on keeping production going, especially since he outlined the consequences of the depression in a fairly critical and humanistic way at the start of the essay. He called it a stupid depression. He makes numerous analogies between depression and war, so I assumed his call for further destruction was a play on these analogies. But no, it's serious apparently. Let's destroy buildings? No, seriously, he advocates destroying buildings. London does claim that he's against destroying things for no reason, only when they are deemed obsolete should they then be recalled by the government. But there's a logical problem here. He is aiming to stimulate spending in the economy. If his policy would destroy things only at the point people would have got rid of them anyway, it would have no bite at all because spending would remain the same. For the policy to work and increase spending, it would have to take things away from people and destroy them before that point. And if we have a whole bunch of functioning things, then why destroy them? London's arguments are pretty ill thought out overall, an especially amusing part of the essay is where he makes an analogy between his plans and the use of coal for energy. Even in the present organization of our economic society, we recognize in many instances the necessity of destroying some of our wealth in order to increase it. For example, coal is wealth, but it is burned up and destroyed daily in locomotives, furnaces, and other devices in order to create power to drive machinery and manufacture goods. Coal is an input, Bernard. It is converted into energy. We need it to make things physically work. We do not need to destroy buildings. Hey, did you know that coal is destroyed in the process of creating electricity? That's why it doesn't matter that I wrote the car off. Aside from me absolutely owning this guy who nobody knows about and is long dead, this gives me an opportunity to speak a little bit about how people thought we should end the depression. You see, there were two main schools of thought in the Anglo-American world during the 1930s, the Austrians and the Keynesians. The Austrians believed that massive economic recession was a necessary consequence of the preceding boom. You see, the Roaring Twenties was a period which saw the world emerge out of a war and a pandemic to grow at a fast rate. Times were good, employment was up, the champagne was flowing, and new inventions were making everyday life easier for ordinary people. For Austrians, if there was... That's actually going to be an animation, but I'll, I'll re-record it anyway. Just cracking my little nose. <laughs> For Austrians, if there is an outright boom and the money is flowing, it's a sign that there's something wrong. Austrians tend to dislike central banks, who they see as printing too much money, driving interest rates down so that borrowing is too easy. This can fuel speculative bubbles as borrowing is so cheap, people will liberally borrow to speculate on whatever crappy business venture they can get their hands on. This accurately describes the speculation of the Roaring Twenties. When the bust finally comes, as it did so brutally during the Great Depression... Logo's gone! No. Oh. Fucking load that. When the bust finally comes, as it did so brutally during the Great Depression, we have to take our medicine as the economy readjusts back to a sustainable path. Depending on which Austrian you ask, they may advocate some temporary measures so that people don't literally starve to death. The famous Austrian Friedrich Hayek was one of these. Other Austrians want to create camps to keep homosexuals out, so, uh, you know, 
there's that. Keynesians had a different view. They thought that there was nothing inevitable or necessary about an economic downturn. While financial bubbles are real and should be avoided, once the bubble bursts, there are measures that governments can and should enact to combat the ensuing downturn. According to this argument, recessions are just the result of a lack of adequate demand and general activity in the economy, so solving them is simply a matter of boosting this demand. This can be done in a number of ways, but the primary one that's favoured by Keynesians historically is for governments to engage in what's called fiscal stimulus and build bridges, invest in hospitals, subsidise businesses, and so on. The dispute between the Austrians and the Keynesians is so well known that it was actually one of the only economics jokes I've ever seen in The Simpsons. To decide how much your electricity bills will rise, I have assembled a team of distinguished economists and placed plausible rate hike percentages on their backs. Now, we will use unfettered free market principles to arrive at a number. <laughs> Release the hounds. <laughs> Notice how the Keynesians climb trees while the Austrian school economists hide under rocks. That is fascinating. Again, we see the attempt at a reference which only works if you will it to work. The example of trees versus rocks is actually quite random and ultimately not really funny whether you know the topic or not. In the same episode, they recycle the famous Boo Earns joke, showing clearly that they've run out of idea. Oh wait, this video is about planned obsolescence. You may have been able to tell from my not entirely unbiased summaries that I lean more towards the Keynesian side of things. I have some good reasons for this, such as the fact that you don't see the Austrian story in the data, whereas you do see the Keynesian one. But that's not my point here. What's interesting is that neither Austrians nor Keynesians, in my estimation, do an especially good job at dealing with planned obsolescence, and their responses tell us different things about why it's a problem. I want to note that I'm talking about the core historical principles of the schools, and both can be modified to ameliorate my objections. But remember, I'm primarily interested in understanding planned obsolescence, and these core historical principles help us to do that. Austrians tend to be free market libertarians, so their rote response to an issue like planned obsolescence is that type of unconvincing and frankly uninteresting brand of libertarian analysis that assumes markets are always right. So when people buy grapefruits, that's because they want the grapefruits. Yeah, fair enough. But what if companies convince us through advertising that we want products that are not really better than what we have? Then the company has successfully informed and persuaded the consumer's decision. Uh... Maybe. But what about if companies literally conspire to shorten the lifespan of light bulbs and consumers don't find out about it for decades? It's what consumers want. If they don't want it, then the market will shift over time towards long life light bulbs. What about racism? Does that happen just because consumers want it too? Don't answer that. You can say it's what the consumer wants in any situation. It's a tautology. It's unsatisfying because consumers actively speak out against things like planned obsolescence, as we saw with right to repair. They may have to grin and bear it in the end, but they'd rather companies didn't do it. The force of consumer demand is reactive rather than active and has to deal with the options put on the table by companies. It's a blunt tool for addressing a fundamental issue like planned obsolescence. There are smarter Austrian arguments than that. Two might be, sure, planned obsolescence is bad, but if you look into it, most of it's the result of government regulations. If you want an example of this, look at how disposable e-cigarettes became so commonplace. It is the fault of government regulation. But that doesn't apply to light bulbs or printers where regulations have actively fought against the practice. Another better Austrian defence might be, sure, planned obsolescence is bad, but overall the market system does more good than harm. I'll hopefully address this one throughout the rest of the video. Unfortunately, Austrians have a habit of being the most unreasonable version of themselves that they can be, so you'll see the uninteresting objection more than the others. But before I get too smug, well, let's be honest, it's too late for that. Planned obsolescence holds some uncomfortable lessons for Keynesians too. If you believe that the economy should be kept going by spending, then planned obsolescence is a clear way of achieving this goal. For us Keynesians, this shines an uncomfortable light on the notion of stimulating production for its own sake. Bernard London's notion of destroying buildings just to rebuild them is absurd and no Keynesians seriously advocate it. But Keynes himself was less concerned with what production was doing than with how much production there was. I see no reason to suppose that the existing system seriously misemploys the factors of production which are in use. 
There are, of course, errors of foresight, but these would not be avoided by centralizing decisions. When 9 million men are employed out of 10 million willing and able to work, there is no evidence that the labor of these 9 million men is misdirected. The complaint against the present system is not that these 9 million men ought to be employed on different tasks, but that tasks should be available for the remaining 1 million men. It is in determining the volume, not the direction, of actual employment that the existing system has broken down. Franklin Roosevelt concurred with Keynes, and this was a big motivation in his New Deal policies, which massively expanded government spending to boost employment. Many of these policies were good ideas, but the aim remained to boost the economy and employment, rather than reorienting it. It's hard to believe from listening to some Austrian economists, but Keynes himself was a pragmatic saviour of capitalism, and he saved it by keeping production going and therefore keeping the population happy. But this seems wrong in the face of planned obsolescence. Wasting effort, time and resources by making products inferior keeps spending high and is exactly what manufacturers were trying to do in the same period, as Giles Slade recounts. During the Depression, manufacturers were forced to return to the practice of adulteration, the 19th century technique of using inferior materials in manufactured goods. As a simple cost-cutting measure, inferior materials lowered unit costs. But these same manufacturers soon realized that adulteration also stimulated demand. After a decade of unprecedented affluence and consumption during the 1920s, consumer demand fell radically with the onset of the Depression. And in desperation, manufacturers used inferior materials to deliberately shorten the lifespans of products and force consumers to purchase replacements. Bernard London wrote an absurd essay where everything would be destroyed after a certain time by overt government compulsion. Nobody really paid attention to him, and these days people just look at the essay as a historical curiosity, the first time planned obsolescence was written down. But we're doing what London suggested, just without the overt government compulsion. All of the absurdities of his essay, the waste, the destruction of value, and the environmental damage, are happening. Austrians can only pretend that planned obsolescence isn't real or doesn't matter, but at the very least, it should force us Keynesians to think a little bit more about when keeping the economy going might lead to other undesirable outcomes. If you follow my channel, you'll know I'm not a massive fan of sweeping statements about capitalism. Sometimes more radical lefties will complain about my apparent lack of revolutionary zeal. Apparently, I'm too reformist and don't say enough things like, once again we see the contradictions inherent in capitalism, or the logic of accumulation leads to intermittent crisis and exploitation of labour and the environment, or the material conditions. I certainly have a different approach to economics than many lefties. I've watched a lot of left-wing video essays and many of the more economic ones, which is a relative term, Use an illustrative case study. It's usually a piece of media, a film, TV series, computer game, or whatever, to show you, as they may say at the end, and that's why capitalism is bad. It's not that the critique of capitalism doesn't follow at all, but it usually feels short and shallow compared to the rest of the often lengthy essay. It's no coincidence this parody by Man Carrying Things has one million views. In this four and a half hour video essay, I'm going to explore why Spongebob is, uh, you know, a really good show. Part one. Early cinema, 1894 to 1904. And this other one has two million views. Capitalism. They could be a part of the same essay. This is an accessible way of communicating important points about how capitalism ruins things, especially art. It's obviously well suited to YouTube. These videos by Cuck Philosophy and Super Eye Patch Wolf about The Simpsons are nice examples. As they point out, The Simpsons has become more of a brand than anything, a parody of itself that is only a shell of the product that it used to be, yet makes money based on historical inertia alone. And that's why capitalism is bad. 
Oh, wait, this video is about planned obsolescence. No, that was relevant. My head is exploding. Sometimes the case study is not a piece of media exactly, but an example of how capitalism ruins things. I'm a bit tired of critiquing lefty YouTubers, to be honest, but let me give you an example to show you I'm not making it up. This recent Sarah Z video on sex bots. She explores an app called Replica, which is a chat style app with an avatar for your virtual friend who seems oddly interested in dirty talk and is quite possessive. Replica was aggressively advertised to lonely people as a companion to an extent that seems obviously predatory. Being a Sarah Z video, it's compelling and contains a tremendous amount of nuance. It's also far from the worst example of and that's why capitalism is bad. So I'm trying to steal man here. One of her points is that everybody laughed at the people who freaked out after their virtual dating partner had their software changed and no longer seemed recognizable. But why would you laugh at emotionally vulnerable people who have been targeted by this company, then had that same company take one of their few emotional crutches away? These people could be lonely, victims of abuse, or have mental health problems, so altering Replica did real harm for them. This gets even worse when you consider the fact that by virtue of how Replica was designed, we're not just looking at a relationship app that promised relationships to vulnerable people and took them away. The way Replica is designed feels, at least to me, very intentionally crafted to make you dependent on it. Contrast this social and emotional nuance with the critique of capitalism Sarah Zed moves on to later. She seems content to say repeatedly that the makers of Replica just care about money and that's why everything went wrong. It's a multi-million dollar company using predatory tactics, literally seduction, to bilk money out of its user base. That sucks no matter what the service is. Everyone involved, the developers, the users, serve only one true master, and that is money. That system's primary intention, necessarily, is to make money for its shareholders. Anything else is ancillary to that primary goal. It's tempting to draw a tendentious analogy and say, Hey Sarah Zed, why aren't you as nuanced towards capitalism as you are towards the incels? But I won't. What I will do is play this clip from Team America. Let me explain to you how this works. You see, the corporations finance Team America, and then Team America goes out, and the corporations sit there in their in their corporation buildings, and 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 see that they're all corporation-y, and they make money. Hmm? First, I'd say a couple of facts conflict with Sarah Zed's interpretation that the issues with these platforms were all about money. When Replica changed their bots, it was partially in response to outrage from users themselves at how sexualized the ad campaigns were, and that the bot was sexually harassing them, as well as an overt regulatory threat from Italy. Changing the bots was a clumsy, knee-jerk decision that was terribly executed, but it wasn't purely anti-user and pro-profit. There's a good case that it came from numerous social and legal challenges to the company. Sarah Zed uses Replica as an example to launch a critique of the modern internet, and fair enough, I'm on the record as saying capitalism has ruined the internet. But again, her examples leave a little to be desired. She notes that the shutdown of Twitter was over conservative regulations and laws which had compelled advertisers and companies to behave in certain ways. Twitter, a social network created for sex workers to interact with one another in a non-hostile setting, was forced to shut down last year after a series of laws in both the United States and Australia disallowed them to continue functioning. Controlling the money is one way of forcing people to comply, but it's not the only way. It's the primary the primary issue here, not the puritanical, anti-LGBTQ, anti-sex work attitudes and legislation in the first place. If capitalists are just concerned with money, as Sarah Zed argues, I don't think they inherently dislike sex work or LGBTQ people. If they could make money from them, then why wouldn't they? Sarah Zed even acknowledges that OnlyFans, who famously disallowed sex work under pressure from financial companies, eventually figured it out and re-allowed sex work. So either they did care about their users, or, more likely, making money means taking care of their users to a degree. I'm not defending any of these platforms, by the way. I just think that the long history of anti-sex work attitudes and laws may be a bigger factor than financial capitalism in this case. Let's assume that Replica's mistakes were because of the profit motive, though. I still wouldn't find a video like this a compelling critique of capitalism. If I were to put my Austrian hat on, I'd say something like, Replica is one company who made some 
some bad decisions, but provided a necessary service for lonely people, something Sarah Zed acknowledges in the video. This bad decision immediately cost them, and so they reversed it, which is how capitalism is supposed to work. It responds to consumer feedback. The profit motive doesn't result in the best outcome every time, though. It just means that the good is rewarded more than the bad over the long term. An easy way to show you the issue with this case study approach is that you can do it with almost anything. I could take cars built by the USSR or communist China and drive them around mockingly, showing how rubbish they were and using that as evidence that socialism was bad. If you don't believe the example, know that the UK TV show Top Gear did exactly this. Communism. Has it ever produced a good car? This prompts questions though. Which type of socialism is bad? Could we improve things under the same basic system? Are cars among the most important issue when considering economic systems? What about the Moscow subway and the other good socialism may have done in these countries? Why are you watching Top Gear in the first place? These are all good questions, and the answer is because my fucking boomer uncle made me. Equivalently, the profit motive conflicts sometimes with what's good for consumers, workers, and the environment. This should be obvious to anyone who isn't a raging ideologue. But all forms of organization have problems. You're not going to find any that don't. Maybe capitalism's just really bad at AI bots specifically. Who knows? Or maybe we're all still figuring them out. The question of whether the good outweighs the bad and the question of whether policy can help to solve the problem of AI bots within capitalism is often left unexplored. It's fine, really. It's just an example of somebody trying to do economics when they don't have the tools to do it properly. Like when I tried to do anthropology earlier, remember? With all that said, planned obsolescence really does reveal the fundamental limits of capitalism. The material conditions. It is a result of companies minimizing costs while maximizing revenues, rather than wider social and historical forces. It is observed across the entire economy, not just one business or industry. It is difficult to address within the system because it keeps the economy going in a quasi-Keynesian manner. Let me explain all this one more time. Planned obsolescence hits capitalism in its traditional heart of manufacturing, from old pocket watches to modern smartphones, from the first Ford cars to electric vehicles today, from stockings in the 1930s to fast fashion. You won't get that problem with faulty cables anymore. It would literally be plug in, they don't break. What you're saying is your product lasts not just long, it just lasts a lifetime, over above a copper product. Yes. Copper yeah. products do go wrong. So if you think about that from a business perspective, yep. what does that tell you about your product? Because if your product is so good that you buy it once, yeah. You're not going to get any repeat business. Have you thought about that? It also applies to new sectors like the digital economy. Software updates can be used explicitly to make older products work poorly. Companies can program software to stop things from working deliberately after a set period of time, even when they are perfectly functional. Many computer games pressure you to spend more money once inside the game to keep up with what's going on, making your game obsolete if you don't continue to pay them. Um, check out these videos if you want to learn more about that type of planned obsolescence, although they don't call it that in the videos. Planned obsolescence even affects the market for economics textbooks, with new ones being brought out with only mild alterations and when the existing ones were just fine. Well, okay, they weren't just fine, but that was for different reasons which the replacements didn't solve, including that the textbooks don't discuss planned obsolescence. There is a notion in biology called convergent evolution, where evolution comes up with essentially the same solution to a problem through different means. Dolphins and sharks are actually kind of similar, as you can see from this helpful picture. One evolved from a line of creatures that have always been underwater, whereas the other's evolutionary timeline included creatures that were in the water, came out, then went back in again. There are theoretical papers in economics showing a drive towards planned obsolescence in both competitive and uncompetitive markets, if you're into that kind of thing. Just like having fins underwater, the drive towards planned obsolescence and its close cousins does seem irresistible for capitalism, whatever the path to get there. The Phoebus cartel was a literal capitalist conspiracy, but that's not even the most common way to shorten the lifespan of consumer products. Henry Ford, who was one of the most powerful industrialists of his time, had a personal vendetta against low-quality cars or minor improvements which made people buy more. But even Ford had to give in to perceived obsolescence owing to new competition and consumer trends. 
Yankee watches weren't deliberate either. The company initially offered repairs, but consumers didn't want them because the new watch was only $1 and the company happily obliged. There's a systemic problem here. Capitalism working literally as it is supposed to, providing new technologies to people for low cost, has these adverse effects. These processes are exactly what lovers of capitalism celebrate. Competition, falling prices, a wide variety of products, those are fair things to celebrate on their own. But it's much harder to deny that planned obsolescence is a necessary outcome of those same processes. Libertarian attempts to do this are generally unconvincing. You may respond that we just need good regulation, and I'd agree with you in principle. I really do love regulation, but planned obsolescence is quite hard to regulate in practice. France is the only country in the world to pass an outright law against planned obsolescence because, of course, they are. The French law prohibits the use of techniques by which the person in charge of placing a product on the market aims to deliberately reduce its lifespan in order to increase its replacement rate. There has been difficulty enforcing this regulation, with the government admitting it is difficult to identify clear instances where companies have deliberately reduced the lifespan of a product. While Right to Repair had some remarkable success, the repairability of most smartphones remains too low and it's still pretty expensive. Small repair companies say they are being squeezed by Apple, running them out of business. You can contrast this with other regulations like health and safety, workers' rights, even antitrust regulations against monopolies. All have a hard-fought history and there's always a give and take as companies fight against them. But all of them have more enactment and enforceability than the regulations against planned obsolescence. Recall that one of the only regulatory victories against planned obsolescence was the antitrust case against the Phoebus cartel. The EU has a number of initiatives which so far seem not to have taken off. Maybe one day we'll find regulations which manage to reduce planned obsolescence within capitalism. Just like how one day I'll be able to type obsolescence correctly. Fuck's sake. The more fundamental question is whether we truly want to get rid of planned obsolescence as a society. When discussing the failure of regulation, people often talk about the power of capital and the political limits of what we can do. They will cite lobbying, corruption, withdrawal of investment, and so on. These are problems for sure, but there is an even more fundamental limit. Everyone relies on capitalism as it currently exists. If you somehow had the knowledge and political power to ban planned obsolescence in all its forms, the result could well be a stagnating economy, with lower employment, lower consumption, and all the according troubles that brings when people rebel. The Keynesians were right about this. I'm not letting the Phoebus lightbulb cartel off the hook and saying, well, we're all to blame. That's always a lazy and unhelpful conclusion. But I am saying that the system we operate in means we all have a stake in continuing this practice and others like it. Businesses obviously desire planned obsolescence and continually pursue it. Consumers will tend towards whatever has a lower price, and that appears to be buying another Yankee watch or iPhone instead of repairing your current one. Politicians tend to buy into measures which will, one way or another, keep the economy going and keep people happy. These material conditions have engendered a culture where we don't typically repair, reuse, or keep functional items anymore. To finish, let me illustrate this point in the spirit of left YouTube using a film. The Man in the White Suit was released in 1951. Sidney Stratton, played by a young Alec Guinness, works as a scientist in the local clothing factory. He invents a shirt which is indestructible, lasting forever without needing to be cleaned. This excites him and everyone else, at least at first. Don't you understand what this means? Millions of people all over the world living lives of drudgery, fighting an endless losing battle against shabbiness and dirt. You've won that battle for them. You've set them free. The whole world's going to bless you. The company soon realises that this will affect their sales. They try to pressure him and buy him off, but he is principled and refuses on the grounds that his T-shirt will save the world. It never gets dirty and never wears out. That's right. Now what do you think of him? And you think they'll go ahead with it? Certainly. You're not even born yet. What do you think happened to all the other things? The razor blade that never gets blunt, and the, the car that runs on water with a pinch of something in it. No. They'll never let your stuff on the market in a million years. He's right, you know. 
vested interest. The dead hand of monopoly. What's most interesting here is not the usual complaint that the profit motive leads to negative outcomes, although that is true. There's capitalism for you. It's that it's not only the capitalists who end up turning against him. The unions do too, because it's going to cost them employment. Oh, side do you want? The same as you, don't you understand? They want to stop it. So do we. Capital and labour are hand in hand in this. He even incurs the wrath of a local woman who is presumably a homemaker and remarks that she'll have no role in society if his shirt goes into production. Why can't you scientists leave things alone? What about my bit of washing when there's no washing to do? Stratton is hunted down by the entire town because his invention is going to destroy the local economy. When it's revealed that the shirt does not last forever as it falls apart on his back, the town rejoices. This absurd paradox was noticed during the Great Depression by none other than King Camp Gillet. We have the paradox of idle men only too anxious for work and idle plants in perfect conditions for production at the same time that people are starving and frozen. The reason is overproduction. It seems a bit absurd that when we have overproduced, we should go without. One would think that overproduction would warrant a furious holiday and a riot of feasting and display of all the superfluous goods lying around. On the contrary, overproduction produces want. There are clear, systemic tendencies towards practices like planned obsolescence. Companies will always push new products over old ones in the pursuit of profit. Consumers will, rightly or wrongly, continue to buy them. But more than this, our employment, livelihoods and well-being depend on it. Despite ripping us off, producing massive waste, destroying the environment and conflicting with deeply held values about things which are bought for life, none of us can get off the treadmill we've collectively created. Planned obsolescence isn't capitalism failing, it's capitalism working. And that's why capitalism is bad. Hey everybody, thanks very much for watching all the way to the end, I hope you enjoyed the video. It's a little bit different, I think. It was actually originally intended as an informational video, like I was going to try my hand at like 20 minutes on planned obsolescence, what does it look like? But things got a little bit out of hand as you can see uh it did take a while for this to come so thanks for being patient with me i'm self-employed now i'm doing this full time and the video frequency is going to increase for sure so we'll be looking you know every two to three months as opposed to every three to four months or uh, you know maybe even maybe even more frequent videos than that, but I don't want to overpromise. Thank you to my patrons who have been especially patient with me while I create this video. Thanks very much to Hobby for editing and helping me out in all sorts of ways. Thanks to Ignos uh, and Evangeline Theodora for providing me with the quotes. So I think that's it. I will see you all next time. And guess what time it is next time. That's right. It's the Thomas Soul video.